Hello everybody and welcome to a Eigenverse Houdini tutorial. Today I thought I'd go over some of the techniques I use to create the low poly aesthetic in Houdini. This is going to be a fairly basic tutorial. I'm going to go over some of the pretty simple nodes, no vex coding or anything, but I just wanted to give a bit of an introduction to um, Houdini using some low poly examples. So first of all, I'm going to create a geometry node. I'm going to delete the file in there and then instead create a sphere. And then I'm going to change the primitive type to be a polygon. So instead of being a low frequency polygon, I'm actually going to crank this frequency up to about six, maybe seven, I might change it. And it's a bit ridiculous to start off high poly and go low poly, but there's a bit of method to my madness. So after that, we're going to add the mountain sop, one of the most useful sops in Houdini, I think. And you can change the height and frequency and a lot of different parameters in this. And you can change the noise type. For the most part, I like using Perlin. It's a pretty basic noise that generally gets the general noisiness of something like you want. So after that, I'm actually going to use a poly reduce. And so normally this is used for creating a high poly mesh and then poly reducing down to get the general um, look of the mesh. And that way you can bake the normals or anything like that. But I'm actually going to be using it for a slightly different effect and instead get it so that when I reduce it down to say 50 or even lower at like 10, you sort of see that it's retaining that general noisiness from the beginning, but you get these nice non-equilateral triangles and it creates a nice little look for the low poly. So now, if this was a normal low poly thing, you could then add a normal SOP and then say zero to make it completely flat shaded. And that's already sort of getting that N64 look. But my personal preference is to sort of have a hybrid style where it's that low poly, but it doesn't give that super jagged edges that you get like a super old school game and you can get something a bit more pleasing. So what I'm going to do after this poly reduce is throw on a poly bevel. And here I'm going, this is allows you to sort of change these edges. And so the first thing I'm going to do is create a bit of the bevel here and then say three, two, it doesn't really matter. And then one thing that I like to do is say ignore flat edges and say about 15. Uh, so what this does is instead of doing every single um, edge, it actually looks for the edges of 15 and then bevels those. And so what happens when you do that is when you look at the smooth shaded without the wires, you get a neat effect of it looking pretty nice, but it doesn't have, it sort of smooths out part of it. So now that we have this sort of looking okay, we're going to add a bit more personality to it go back to the wire shaded. So before this poly bevel, what I'm going to do is actually add a twist modifier. And then here you can change the strength of this to say the angle, let's say 60 or so. And then instead of it going down the Z axis, let's say the Y axis instead. And so this allows you to give a little bit more noise um, to the sphere. And then one thing I'm also going to do is in this poly bevel, sometimes this allow vertex splits cause some problems. It sort of depends on each individual thing you're working on, but I generally like turning it off. It allows for just a bit more stable topology. Um, so now that we have this little cool sphere going, I'm going to show you a couple things you can do to add to it and some of the techniques I use to create um, different meshes. So right now I'm going to actually show you how I created a cloud. And so first thing I'm going to start off with is another sphere. And I'm going to change that to uh, polygons, highlight that. Once again, we'll do about a five, six frequency. This is actually just going to be a basis for uh, points to copy these on. So this doesn't super matter, but I'm going to also add another mountain stop to this. 
But instead of the perlin, I'm actually going to use a sinusoidal. And that gives that kind of blobby shape. So I'm going to use a sinusoidal and then I'm going to change the radius of the sphere to be a little bit longer. So then I'm also going to take a transform and then sort of just manually rotate this up. And this is just to get a sort of general cloudy structure. You can mess with the mountain uh, the size of the sphere or whatever. So after that, I'm going to, there's two different methods of doing this. You can either ISO offset, and you can use a volume visualize to see what's going on here. I'm going to increase the density scale to say 100. So you can see it's just taking the original mesh and then creating a volume. And then I'm going to scatter some points onto that. Now, right now it's at a thousand and that's way too many for our purposes. We're only going to do about 50 or so. The other method of doing this is you can actually skip this and just go straight to points from volume. And I personally usually just do this ISO offset because that's what I learned initially. So after you've gotten these points, you're going to then copy these spheres to points. So you take the primitives to copy, and then you take the points, and now we see we've copied those spheres onto this point cloud. So right now you can see it's just the same mesh kind of copied to these points, and it's not very exciting yet. There's a lot of things we can do to add some variety to this. One of the first things we can do is change the P scale. So we're going to take an attribute randomize and drop that between the scatter and the copy of the points. So initially it does color, but in this case what I want is P scale. So here's where you can change the values of the minimum value and the maximum value of P scale. I don't necessarily want zero here, so I'm going to do something like maybe 0.5 and 1.25. Actually, I'm going to go even lower so we just don't get these other ones. So after you've done that, that's starting to be um, sort of cloud-like, but they're all still facing the same way. And that's when I'm going to use something called copy stamping. So that's similar to copy to points, but you can get the information of a point per point number. Okay, so I'm going to drop this copy stamp in here and take, once again, the template points and the primitive points. And then the most important part of copy stamping is the stamp inputs. So that takes the these variables and it can uh, reference these variables later up in the line for this primitive that you're copying. So what I'm going to do here is actually add a random value to these copy values so that I can reference them and say, change the angle. So the first thing I'm going to do is use the rand function. And let's take a look at that rand function. So it's saying we need a random and then a value. So I'm going to take a seed value, and what I'm going to do as to use for the seed value is take the point number, and then add some random number as the seed value. It doesn't really matter what it is, usually you want to use something big, but it's just a seed to vary everything. And then in addition to taking this random value, I want to fit it between two different values. And since I'm doing this for um, the angle, I'm going, to vary, I'm going to fit it in between negative 360 and 360. So I'm going to take the fit function. Let's look at the help tool for that. Oh, and I had a mistype. It's not thought, it's fit. Let's try that again. Just type it in. Man. Okay, so I'm back here. I'm not entirely sure what was going wrong, but 
it just wasn't working, and now it is, which is a typical Houdini problem, so you better just get used to that. So I'm actually going to do fit a one, and then you take the random value, and then it says new min, so here I'm going to do minus 360, comma, and then 360. And then let's check on what that's currently giving us, 129.842, so that's between negative 360 and 360, so it seems to be working for right now. So the special part about this copy to copy stamping is right now it's getting this random number based on this, but you can actually reference this on the per point, on the point attribute, so it will change on each individual instance. So I'm going to, first of all, take off this polybethyl for right now, and then add instead a transform. Let's get rid of this window. I'm going to move it to the other screen. And so with this transform, I'm going to reference the copy stamp. So I put stamp. Let's see if I can find this one again. Apparently not, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna wing it. <laughs> so you go for the stamp, and then you do quotations, and then you reference here this node. So you're going to do period period backstep backtick uh, copy one, and then you're going to reference whatever the variable was called. And in this case, I forgot to do it. So I'm going to just go ahead and call this random rand01. I'm going to go back to this. Do rand01. And then after that, you're going to need a one. And here, usually, I'm not sure of the exact nomenclature, but you generally need a default value. So I'm going to say this is default to one, so that way I don't have a syntax error. And I put an exclamation point. So instead, I'm going to do one, and everything is working relatively. So now we see is actually going randomly. You get a lot more variation. So for right now, I'm happy with the general sense of that, but as you can see, it's all intersecting and it looks really weird for right now. So let's see what we can do about that. So after this copy, I'm going to do a Boolean function. And what I want this for is this resolve self intersections. So if I turn on the points, you can see it creates a bunch of new points so that it's now hollow on the inside and they're all generally merged up. But what I want isn't necessarily all this weird um, intersections. I wanted the general shape of this, but I still wanted that low poly aesthetic. And right now it just looks like a little mangled mesh. Um, so after this Boolean, I'm going to remesh it. And then I'm going to poly reduce it. And poly reduce this, this by, say, 50, or in this case, I'm going to actually poly reduce it by quite a bit. And it all depends on what you want. So the two different options for this is you can either remesh it if you want something very solid still. If you don't want something solid, you can skip this remesh and only do a poly reduce by about 50. And in this case, you're still getting the bit finer details, um, but it's a little bit more merged. So you can experiment around with exactly what parameters you want. You can change everything up on the line. So for right now, to see how this all looks for right now, let's go ahead and add a normal, or first actually, Let's take that poly uh, bevel we had up here and just drop it down here. So you can see that added the poly bevel all along these lines to get that, once again, a sort of hybrid style. And when you have the poly bevel, you actually don't have to do the flat shading. I'm going to preview a 
smooth shaded and you can kind of see what this looks like with zero flat shading or a little bit or whatever your preference. But for right now, I'm going to go ahead and just use the flat shading with the polymethyl. So let's go ahead and see what some of the different attributes look like when we change them. So let's try to make these quite a bit smaller for right now. Let's do like 0 0.1, even 0.5. So right now that's looking a lot more interesting. You're getting a lot more little smaller balls of what look kind of like crumpled paper. And then you get these small things, the big things, and then there's nice intersections in between that. And then also an added thing with the polyreduces, it's polyreducing at a bit of a different angle everywhere. So you're getting some interesting things. One thing that I like to do, but it's a bit um, intensive for time waiting, is if you want to really add some variation, you can go ahead and take the copy stamp we're doing here, and instead of just transforming it um, on the rotations, we can go ahead and copy this. And let's see what happens when I go ahead and do it on the mountain of, um, stop. And I'm going to paste it in the offset. So it's going to pan that uh, mountain a different way for each individual uh, instance. So you can see here, it didn't change the general shape so much. It just added a little bit of extra variation. Um, something had, has gone on with the poly bevel, I believe. Let's go ahead and see what we can do about that. And generally, when you have things like this, I find it's usually because there's overlapping vertices. Let's see if a fuse fix that up? No. Give me one moment. All right. Okay, I'm back. And in this case, like I was, I was saying before, I generally turn this off. But in this case, I actually did want to allow vertex splits. So like I was saying, it sort of depends on what you're doing, but a lot of times when you have those poly bevel errors, check that first because that is sometimes the main offender. So go ahead and let me know um, if I skipped over anything that you'd like some more information on. I plan to do a couple more in this series to go ahead and show some of the simple techniques I use to once again to get that sort of low poly aesthetic. And I'm also doing should be doing more along the lines of doing normal graphics for abstract art or say some nice vfx arts which i personally really like so thank you so much for watching i really appreciate your time and i hope that i taught you a thing or two